Well, I'd like to uh, thank the Committee of the Reformation Society, first of all, for the kind invitation to speak to you tonight, and also for supplying a title. I always feel happier when I'm supplied with a title, because I, at least I know that someone will find it relevant when I speak. So, thank you for doing that. I was given the title on the phone, and the title is Scotland, a Covenanted Nation. Now, my first response to that was, is that a statement or a question? Should it have an exclamation mark after it, or should it have a question mark after it? So, I agreed with the person who gave me the title that we should just put a question mark after it. But that's only for the sake of the meeting tonight. For myself, I would very happily put an exclamation mark after it and assert that Scotland is a covenanted nation, but we'll deal with it as though there's a question mark after it. Now, the subject, as you probably know, is fairly big, and in a way, it's complex. There may be quite a few people here who know more about it than I do, but I'm going to assume that most know less so, I'm going to assume, in a way, as little knowledge as I can, just to make sure that we have a pretty clear grasp of the fundamental truths in connection with Scotland as a covenanted nation. And our time is pretty short, so I don't want to waste any more time but just to begin looking at our theme. And I'd like to break it down very simply as follows. First, what is a covenant? Second, what is a national covenant? Third, is Scotland covenanted? Fourth, is that covenant still binding? Fifth, what are the implications? And in many ways, as our brother mentioned in the introduction, the last is the most important. If there is a covenant, if it is binding, what are the implications? What do 17th century national covenants mean for you and for me? So let's begin then at the beginning. What is a covenant? Now some of you will be familiar with the standard response to that, which is that a covenant is a solemn agreement between two or more parties. Whether they are individuals or groups, it doesn't matter. A covenant is a solemn agreement agreement between two or more parties. Now, let me highlight just a couple of things. First of all, a covenant is a little more than a simple agreement. A covenant carries penalties and rewards in connection with it. In other words, a covenant is enforceable by law. So, that makes it different from an agreement. An agreement is not necessarily enforceable by law, but a covenant is. Now, whether that law that enforces it is God's law or man's law, for the moment, doesn't matter. A covenant is an agreement with penalties and rewards enforceable by law. So, it is a legal thing. Now, some of you may be familiar with what's called a deed of covenant, whereby you undertake to support a charity or something like that. Now, that kind of deed is carefully drawn up it is a legal document, and so on. So, it's more than an agreement. Second, specifically, it is a solemn agreement. And that brings us particularly into the realm of a religious covenant. And that's an agreement in which God is involved. He's involved either as a witness because he is solemnly called upon by the parties, or else he is directly involved as a party himself. In other words, the obligation is to him. There are rewards and penalties connected, but in that case, you see, it is me and God, or you and God directly. In the first case, it is me and you, and we both solemnly call God as witness to it. So in that respect, you see, if I make a covenant with you, you make one with me, if we have called God 
We've called him solemnly as a witness to it. There's a sense in which the promises we make to each other become promises to him. We invoke his character. We invoke his dignity. We invoke his protection. We invoke his righteous retribution if we ourselves fail or default on the terms of that covenant. So it's more than an agreement. It's legally binding. And it is also solemn because God is a party to it. And that's why when we make covenants of that kind and God is involved, it is always in the context of a religious service. There will be an act of prayer accompanying it and so on. Now, who makes covenants? Well, most of us do. A good number of you in here are in a marriage covenant. In the marriage covenant, you made promises to each other in the presence of God. It's more than likely that you are married by a minister in the context of a religious service, which would have begun something like this. We are gathered in the presence of God and before these witnesses. Now, these witnesses are human witnesses so that the civil aspect of it is tied up and correct. Because, remember, it's all enforceable by law. But we are gathered in the presence of God and before these witnesses. means that the promises we make to each other take on the character of being promises to God too. So most of us are in, or a good number of us, are in a marriage covenant. And possibly most of us will end up in a marriage covenant. Some people here, too, are office bearers in a church. Ministers, elders, or deacons. And when you became office bearers, you also made promises to the congregation and some directed to God. These promises are always made in the presence of God and in the context of our religious service. But some of you would say, well, yes, but that's about it. That's the only covenants we ever really enter into in our lives. And that's the only religious covenants we make. These are the only vows that we make. The vows that we make when we become office bearers and the vows that we make when we become married. Now, that may well be the case. But if so, why? Why is that the case? Why is it that the concept of vows and covenanting which permeated the whole of religious Britain in the 16th, 17th centuries, why has it disappeared? Why is making a vow or a covenant almost associated with Roman Catholicism rather than being part of our own religious life and worship? For example, in the past, vows and covenants are common, personal ones. Uh, You see them in the Bible. The Psalms are full of expressions like, Your vows are upon me, O God. Or, I will pay my vows now to the Lord. Or, to thee vows shall be paid. In Psalm 15, the righteous man, the man of God, is characterized as a man who swears, even if it's to its own hurt, he keeps what he has sworn. So, he is able to swear, he's able to vow, he's able to enter a covenant And even if it's a cost to himself, he will keep what he has sworn. So in the Bible, there are personal vows. You'll be familiar with Jacob, for example, vowing a vow at Bethel. Our own heritage is full of it. The Reformers, the Reformation, full of people making personal covenants with God. Matthew Henry makes one, makes several in his life. Jonathan Edwards, Thomas Halliburton, literally hundreds of others. Sometimes you find congregations making covenants with God. I recently read a book called Covenanting with God, written by a Welsh minister who's discovered a host of church covenants in a very lively time in Wales when congregations gathered together and vowed particular things before God. Why they did that, we'll come to it in a moment. So our heritage is full of it. And you see, these people would use certain times of the year in which to renew the covenant or to rededicate themselves to their own vows. Matthew Henry made a practice of it at his own birthday or at New Year, before the Lord's Supper, as Richard Baxter used to do as well, and whenever he witnessed a baptism in the congregation. 
he reconsecrated himself. He would read over the covenant, the baptismal covenant that his father had made with him. And he would rededicate himself at such times to the Lord. And you also see, as well as these personal covenants, you see interpersonal covenants. In other words, one between me and you. In the Bible, David and Jonathan covenant with each other. And you'll notice how binding it is and how seriously David takes it because he recognizes the obligation is ongoing from one generation to another. So when Mephibosheth, who is lame in both feet, needs help, David remembers his covenant with his father and he brings Mephibosheth to sit at his own table. Jacob and Laban make a covenant when they part with each other. They solemnly call God as a witness. The place is called Galid. There's a pile of stones, and there the covenant is remembered. And then again, in our own history in this land, there are many examples of people gathering together to covenant. When William Carey went abroad on mission, he covenanted with several people that they would pray for him constantly. That was a covenant of prayer. And that kind of covenant permeates this country's religion in its best and most glorious days. People will covenant together to pray for certain things and at certain times. There were these kinds of covenants for revival and so on. William Guthrie says that whenever there are problems to be faced, whenever there are great difficulties, when there is a need to stimulate perseverance, and when hands are lagging, when there's a need to provoke each other to a duty which we know we should do, but for some reason we feel weak to carry it out, we should bind ourselves together in a most solemn and holy covenant before God. That is why a covenant in Scotland was frequently called a bond. So in the religious world in Scotland, when you come across the expression bond, you can recognize that we are talking about a covenant. So you've got personal covenants between ourselves and God and interpersonal covenants which are in the sight of God. Many of those in Scotland. A famous bond was signed in 1557. It was that bond that persuaded John Knox to come back to this country because John Knox had pretty much given up on the nobility of the land ever actually doing anything to get the reformation off the ground. Does that sound familiar? The sheer inertia that had gripped the people. But when the lords of the congregation, as they were called, and that's the nobles who had a real interest in, Pro in Protestant reformation, when they gathered together and formally signed a covenant bond, John Knox agreed to come back. And praise the Lord that he did. Had he not, how different the history of the country would be, as we'll see in a moment. But he came back as a result of a bond. Now, you notice that principle at work there, you see, knowing something should be done, feeling weak or afraid, and entering to, into a bond with others before God so that you are more committed before God and you commit one another. You become a check to me and I become a check to you. Do you see immediately the value of a covenant? I was involved in a situation not too long ago when people evaporated very easily simply because there was no bond. And I thought at the time that a bond or a covenant would be the solution to it. And there are many things in the lives of our congregations and churches and nation to which the bond of a covenant is actually the answer. Cities sometimes too would bind themselves. Famously, the city of Geneva pledged themselves, the citizens of it, with their arms raised to God, they pledged themselves as citizens to uphold the Reformed faith. So anyway, that's something about covenanting. I hope that's told us what a covenant is and how it works between persons and ourselves and God. So second, what is a national covenant? Well, a national covenant is what happens when a nation through its representatives, its rulers, dedicates itself or covenants itself with God. So instead of individuals or groups or cities, you have a nation with its representative rulers making a solemn agreement with God. Now, most of us 
Don't even think of such things anymore. But again, that concept of a nation covenanting was widely accepted by Protestants and by Puritans in the 16th and in the 17th century. And it was seen as a desirable goal throughout the whole of Europe that every single nation would one day join themselves in a perpetual covenant before the Lord. We'll see a little later on that our covenant, the Solemn League and Covenant, was one which was designed to leave a door open for any other nation who wished to join in making such covenant before the Lord. And it's just a matter of fact that the European churches envied Scotland because she was the only reformed country that had actually attained to the level of being able to nationally covenant with God. The Reformation was never quite that successful in any other nation. But in Scotland alone, it was so successful that a national covenant was secured in 1638 and five years later in 1643, there was the Solemn League and Covenant too, which I'll come to in a moment. So we know what a national covenant is and that's the dedication of a nation, dedication of itself to God. Now, we can argue for this kind of covenant in many ways. I mean, if you're here saying, well, I'm not sure still about this concept, well, let's step back a little bit. Perhaps one of the best ways to argue for it is just to understand properly the relationship between church and state. And again, with the error of Rome on one side, and with the error of Erastianism on the other, in other words, in one the church rules the state, in the other the state rules the church, it was really again on Scottish soil by the grace of God that the true relationship between state and church was really elucidated, the biblical one. And the understanding is simply this, that Jesus Christ as king has two kingdoms. He has the kingdom of the state, which has ministers of state to do his will, and he has the kingdom of the church with ministers of the gospel to execute his will. Two separate jurisdictions. In their own sphere, one is subordinate to the other all the time. But they are two separate jurisdictions with the ministers in both spheres accountable to Jesus Christ as the king and the head of the church. In other words, both sets of ministers are bound to obey God and they're bound to follow the will of God in their own capacity. So if I am set aside by the grace of God as a minister in the church of Jesus Christ, in the spiritual kingdom, I must take the mandate that God has given and exercise that ministry. If God, in his sovereignty, calls me or calls you into the ministry of state, you are not there to do your own will. You are there to do the will of God. You're not there to do the will of the people. People think you're there to do the will of the people. Not so. If 98% of the people want abortion, are you legitimized to legislate abortion? You're not. You're not. That's where we begin to think that democracy is God. When God is God. And 98% of the people never have a right to legislate for the death of the unborn in the womb. And if God puts you into a position of ministry in the state, you legislate for God. Do we see the point? The same thing applies to me. If a congregation or if a denomination decides to do something outrageous before God, I am not at liberty to say, well, I will follow the will of the congregation. No. If it is against the word of God, it is the word of God that must be followed. We must understand these basic, basic principles. Now, it follows that if the ministers of a church and its elders and its people can solemnly covenant themselves in spiritual matters before God, does it not follow that the rulers of nations who legislate should solemnly covenant themselves before God that each law on the statute book should be in accordance with the book of God? That is simply what national covenanting is all about. Jeremiah 50 verse 5, Let us join ourselves in a perpetual covenant before the Lord which shall not be forgotten. And it looks forward to the day when the nations of the earth, with their kings 
shall bring all their wealth and riches into the kingdom of God, and kings shall be our nursing fathers, queens our nursing mothers. In other words, these are kings and queens which bind themselves before God to nurse the church, to protect the church, to make sure that the legislation of the land guards and honors the bride of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, in some ways, is the easiest way to see the argument for a national covenant. Now, you see such a covenant in the Bible. Now, I'm not talking here about the covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. That is different. The covenants that I'm speaking about are later covenants where the nation pledges itself to God in response to that covenant. For example, in the days of Jehoiada, in the days of Josiah, in the days of Asa, in the days of Hezekiah, you find a nation conscious of her need of reformation and renewal being gathered by her king so that her civil rulers gather and they covenant before God to walk in his ways. I could give you a list of scriptural references. Very simply, you'll find them all in Second Kings and Second Chronicles. Josiah, Asa, Hezekiah in particular. So these kings and officers use their office to turn a people back to God. And it's a marvelous thing to see that happening in the nation of Judah, especially when the people stand up they stand to take the covenant. The same thing was done in Greyfriars Churchyard in Edinburgh in 1638. We'll come to that in a second. But the people stood and they covenanted. They pledged themselves as a nation in response to the covenant that God had made with them. Now, our national covenants are in response to God's covenant too. They're a response to the new covenant that is made in Christ Jesus in which the kings of the earth are as obligated as everyone else to bind themselves in obedience to the one who is at the right hand of God, who is king of nations as well as king of the church. So that's what the idea of a national covenant is. Third, is Scotland covenanted? Well, It's Scotland's glory, friends, that she pledged herself as a nation to God. As I'll say later, it can also be said of England and Ireland, perhaps to a slightly lesser extent, but very much so. But it's to Scotland's glory that she pledged herself distinctly to God in the National Covenant of 1638, and then again with England and Ireland in the Solemn League and Covenant of 1643. Now, I was determined to try and avoid making a dryish history lecture out of this, but you'll excuse me if I divert for a while just to briefly recap some of the history. Please bear with me. First, the National Covenant of 1638. Why did it happen? simply because the Reformation was being systematically unraveled by a tyrannous king. Most of you will be familiar with the fact that the House of Stuart claimed for themselves the divine right of kings. And they were systematically unraveling the religious freedoms and the liberties of the Reformation. Bishops were being intruded into the Church of Scotland who were simply creatures of the king. Kings have always found it easier to work through bishops than to work through ministers. There's an obvious reason for that, but I'll just leave that be. So bishops were being intruded into the church, and at last a new liturgy was being introduced into her worship. And the people of God were weary. It's a weariness that wasn't just in Edinburgh or Glasgow, but it was just extending through the land. Perhaps you can exempt Aberdeen, parts of the northeast, and the northwest too. But the nation was wearied with the change to prelacy or Episcopalianism and especially with the attempt to introduce the new liturgy. And most of you will be aware of what happened when it was publicly read in St. Giles for the first time when a woman took up her prayer stool and threw it at the person who was reading it. And that was the act, probably, 
and certainly the events which followed it, even that day, these were the things that prompted the eventual signing of a covenant before God in the Greyfriars churchyard. Drawn up by Alexander Henderson and a group of nobles, gentry, burgesses, ministers, they gathered and drew up a solemn covenant in which the nation pledged itself to God to follow the reformed faith and to resist and to reject anything that was against it. When that was read in the Greyfriars Kirk, tears were shed. Old men, young men, women too, raised their hands and pledged themselves to the covenant. It was taken outside. It was laying on one of the tombstones. That day and the day following, it was being signed and signed again. Some of you know that it was signed by some people in their own blood. 60,000 people signed that covenant in the first two or three days. Hundreds of copies were made of the thing. And it was put through the length and breadth of the land. Signed in congregations everywhere. All over the country. In the midst of what you could only call a national Revival. Remember that the population of Scotland was somewhere between 800,000 and 900,000. You have 60,000 signing that within two or three days. I would guess at least that a quarter of the population signed it before it was finished signing. Maybe half the population. I've come to the significance of that in a moment. But the result was that the king took fright. He said, if this national covenant is allowed to stand, he says, I have no more power in Scotland than the Duke of Venice does. So he knew the importance of it himself. But it was that which kick-started what's known as the Second Reformation in Scotland. The First Reformation was a reformation from popery, Roman Catholicism. The Second Reformation was a reformation from Episcopalianism and the tyranny of the king. So it was the first free assembly in Glasgow in 1638, following the signing of the covenant, that abolished prelacy and set up the marvellous foundation that we still rest on to some extent. Began a glorious era, the twilight of which we can still somehow see the signing of the national covenant. I'll come back to aspects of that. Let me move forward five years to a second national covenant. This is what is called the Solemn League and Covenant. What happens this time is that the English become fed up of the king. The Parliament in God's providence had become full of Puritans. And they abolished Episcopacy in England. Before they put anything in its place, they appointed an assembly of the godliest men to gather in Westminster to revise the 39 articles of the Church of England because they were conscious that the Reformation in England had ground to a halt. Breaks had been put in it from the top down. So this was a Puritan Parliament shaking itself free from the shackles of a king. How important these things have become. Our freedoms and our constitutional monarchy all stem from these covenants, from the National Covenant and from the Solemn League and Covenant. I'll say something more about that in a minute. But the Parliament called for a solemn assembly of divines to sit at Westminster to revise the articles of the Church of England. The King declared war on the Parliament, which began the English Civil War. The English Parliament, dominated by Puritans, immediately looked north to a purer church, to a more godly commonwealth, and said, will you please send us military help? The Scots turned and said, we are interested in a league. We are interested in military help against a tyrannous king, but we are more interested in a covenant. As well as making a military league with you, can we make a religious bond and a religious covenant? so that the Reformation in England will be moved forward in alignment with the Scottish and with the best and the purest Kirks right throughout Europe. The English Parliament said yes. And so the Scots drew up 
what has become known as the Solemn League and Covenant, which bound the three kingdoms of Scotland, England, and Ireland. Wales at this point is connected to England. If there's any Welsh person here who thinks I'm being negligent of them, there's a reason why Wales is not distinct at this point. You'll know that better than me. So this Solemn League and Covenant bound Scotland, England, and Wales to preserve the Scottish Reformation and to further Reformation in England and in Ireland. Critically, the Solemn League and Covenant was also drawn up to produce new standards for the Church, for the Church in Britain, which would unify the Churches of God in, listen, one form of Church government, one confession of faith, one catechism, and one directory for public worship. And the English Parliament said, yes. The Scottish Assembly immediately sent five commissioners to England, three of whom were ruling elders, because the Scots wished to make a point that elders ruled as well as ministers in the church. And most of you will know the result. The Westminster Assembly, instead of being a specific body, designed to revise the English 39 articles, the articles of the English church, suddenly was empowered to produce new standards in response to a covenant for Scotland, England, and Ireland. And this is the Second Reformation really taking off. And how blessed that assembly was. Out comes a new directory for public worship. Out comes a new confession of faith. The one catechism became two because, as the Scots famously said, it was impossible to produce milk and meat in the one dish. So the larger catechism was for ordinary folk and the shorter catechism for children and people with more limited mental capacity. And one form of church government. Document after document in the 1640s, as the British church rises to its senate and as each document is produced, it is incorporated into the life of the church by an act of assembly, free and sovereign, ratified by the parliament. And that's the order. That order changed after 1690. But that was the order in 1640. The church decides and the parliament ratifies. Notice how the relationship works. That's it working in the best way. When the parliament says, what is your confession? And the church says, this is our confession. And the parliament ratifies it. So document after document, and we could well say that the most glorious period of the church in Scotland stretched from the signing of the National Covenant in 1638 to 1650. This wasn't just a time of legal covenanting, and don't make the mistake of thinking of it like that. If you're thinking about people writing dry documents and signing them, you're missing the point. These people are signing them in tears and in prayer. These documents are going through the churches. The revival of the Kirkoshots takes place at this time. More people apparently were converted per head, per capita, per head of population in Scotland in this decade than at any other time in her history. This is a revival. And it's a revival that is birthed in covenant, notice. When the church stands and covenants herself, when the nation stands and covenants herself, God honors that and souls are born into the kingdom of God. God loves consecration. He loves dedication. He loves putting himself first and he honors it. And you read the history for yourself. It's written. I mean, God alone knows what may happen to it yet. You see books being swept off library shelves. I used to walk through Glasgow Library ten years ago and notice some of the good books on the shelves had disappeared. And I've asked where are they gone, and I've been told they're put into a special annex. And you have to know they're there in the first place before you can take them out. Now, that preached a kind of sermon to me, because, you know, you can get used to good literature, but it can disappear very quickly. And who knows what kind of rubbish may come in its place. So while you can get a hold of the history, read about that period and read about its revivals, and you'll see that God was behind the covenant, and that his spirit was poured out to produce it, and as a result of it. What were these covenants for? They were to pursue reformation in the state and in the church. 
Everyone assigned it dedicated themselves to the abolition of prelacy, whether it was papal or episcopalian. They pledged themselves to the intrusion of episcopalian forms of worship into the church. They pledged themselves to assert the headship of Christ over the nation as well as over the church. They asserted themselves to protect the liberties of Parliament under God. And the Solemn League and Covenant took a drastic step forward in 1643 by speaking of effectively a constitutional monarchy for the first time. Many people have said that the Solemn League and Covenant is the single greatest document for constitutional liberty in the world. But it does undergird American liberty, our own liberty in Britain too. There's a great case for that which you could investigate to yourself sometime. Um, in fact, I think it's, um, I have a book here which, funnily enough, just came into my hands um, a couple of weeks before my title was given to me. The Anglosphere's Broken Covenant, Rediscovering, rediscovering the Validity and the Importance of the Solemn League and Covenant. And an American writer says this, that the third article of the Solemn League implies that the people have a right to appoint their rulers. This was radical stuff. Really radical stuff. And that the people have a right to prescribe the conditions of government according to the will of God. And that no ruler should be chosen who is not friendly to true religion. And that the supreme ruler is bound to respect and maintain the constitutional liberty of the nation. Civil liberty was regarded as founded on religious purity and freedom. The king was to be amenable to the authority of the enthroned mediator on high, while the subjection and civil duties of the people were to be regulated in accordance with God's revealed will. It is not too much to say that to the solemn league and covenant, Britain and America are largely indebted for the freedom which they possess above other nations. That's very thought-provoking. Now, let me ask with you three questions in connection with the national covenants. First, are they truly national? Right, how do you answer that? Is the national covenant really national? What is a national covenant? What makes anything national? An executive can make a treaty with another country. We've been taken to war on much less than the national covenants were placed on. The national covenant was signed by the king, the parliament, the nobles, the barons, the gentlemen, the burgess, the ministers and the people. That makes it fairly national in my book. The Solemn League and Covenant in September 1643, listen to this, this is the document that bound Scotland, England and Ireland, uh, which eventually led to the union of the crowns and so on. In September 1643, when that document came to the Houses of Parliament in England, they were gathered together, the Lords and the Commons, right? The Houses of Lords and the Commons, each article of the Solemn League and Covenant was read clause by clause, and every single member of Parliament, whether Lord or Common, raised his hand and promised clause by clause to God that this covenant would be enforced in the land. Signed by the King, by both Parliaments in England, signed by the Scottish Parliament, signed by the General Assembly. I ask you a simple question. Can you think of anything that is more national than that? Tell me, from the results of general elections to anything else you like, can you think of a single thing that is more national than that? That's more national than the Magna Carta. That's more national than the Bill of Rights. There is nothing more national than the National Covenant and the Solemn League and Covenant. It wasn't just a church. It was every single executive organ of government in England, Scotland and Ireland that signed that pledge to preserve and promote the reformed religion before God. An oath, a covenant, solemnly taken from top to bottom, right throughout the land. There is nothing more national. So, first of all, it is a national covenant, truly national. 
Second, is it or are they still binding? Now, some people say they're not, and they give two reasons. The first reason is that it was signed by a generation that has died long ago. And we cannot consider ourselves bound by what was done many generations ago. The second argument for saying they're still not binding is that these covenants were actually repealed by the king. That's true. At the Restoration in 1660, uh, Charles II began to redouble the efforts of the king to destroy the church in Scotland as it was settled. And one of the things he did was burn the covenants publicly. He declared them null and void. And in fact, even after the so-called Glorious Revolution in 1688 and in 1690 when King William came onto the throne, the acts passed by Charles which declared the covenants null and void were left in place. And in fact, when King Charles was restored, he declared every single act of the Scottish General Assembly in the 1640s null and void. That act is still in the statute book. Sad to say. The acts for Cicero, which make the acts of the church in their most glorious period, the acts which approved every document produced by the Westminster Assembly, he declared these acts null and void. So people say, well, the covenants were burned, they were reversed, so they're not in force. Now, let me say a couple of things in connection with this. First of all, what about the argument that they were signed by a previous generation? The answer to that, very simply, is that national covenants bind the posterity. The reason they do so is because the nation and the church have what you would call a moral personality that continues. The church has a continuing existence. When it pledges something, it continues in force. The nation, too, when it pledges something, it continues in force. For example, when a government signs a peace treaty, it binds the next generation. Let's say, for example, that we enter a peace treaty with um, Germany. And let's say 70 years pass, and we suddenly attack Germany. And the international community is outraged and said, you had a treaty with Germany. And we turn around and said, oh, that was our father. That wasn't us. Would that argument wash? No, it wouldn't wash at all. Take something like the national debt. I'll give you what's probably a surprise to most of you. Some of you may know it. But in 2006, the British government paid £45.5 million pounds to the United States in 2006. What for? It's the last installment of the debt from the Second World War. So obviously there's no one in government now who was in government then. But nobody in government thinks that that's a good reason just to write off the debt. In 2006, December, that was paid. I'll give you a more astonishing one. A couple of years ago, in September 2010, Germany paid £60 million, I think, to the French and to the Belgians, as the last instalment of, wait for it, of reparations after World War I. Most of you have heard of the Treaty of Versailles and the reparations that were put on Germany at the end of the First World War. Now, they would have been paid back three or four years earlier, except that Hitler stopped the repayment or because he was angry about the treaty, as were many Germans. My point is very simple, though. Germany still considered itself two years ago bound to pay these reparations, you see. They didn't say that was our grandfathers, because the debt entered into by the state passed down, because the state is the same, Germany is the same, a church is the same, a nation is the same. It's true in other areas. Inheritance laws, what happens to them? If one generation is not somehow bound up with what a previous generation does, what about the baptism of covenant? With due respect to Baptist friends who are here, uh, what is the baptism of covenant all about if you are uh, a genuine pedo-baptist? If you take vows on behalf of your child, what does that mean? If the child is able to grow up and say, well, I want nothing to do with these vows, the whole point is that the child is not at liberty before God to say, I want nothing to do with these vows. It binds the child. So national agreements bind in the same way unless they were somehow limited at the beginning. For example, if a covenant said, 
we promised that for 10 years such and such, fair enough. But was the National Covenant dedicating Scotland to God for 10 years? Did the Solemn League and Covenant say that Scotland, England and Ireland would bind themselves for 50 years? No, it is, quote, our posterity after us. The Parliament and the Assembly adopt the Covenant for our posterity and all generations to come forever. Look, friends, you see it in the Bible. Joshua makes a covenant with the Gibeonites. Now, if you don't know the history, it's a bit complex to go over it, but the Gibeonites actually deceived Joshua. Notice this, by the way. They deceived Joshua into making a covenant. Joshua promises their protection, thinking they're somebody else. But Joshua, in the name of God and in the presence of God, solemnly promises their protection. 300 years later, King Saul kills some of the Gibeonites. And God says to David, that must be avenged. Now, there was no possibility of saying, well, that was 300 years ago. God says, yes, but it was an oath in my name, and I want to see it avenged. Do you see the solemnity of an oath? Do you see the perpetuity of an oath? Do you see it passing from one generation to another? Uh, Zedekiah promised something under oath to God to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then he decided to go back on it. And he thought probably because Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen king that God would let him off. And God did not let him off. It. He was rebuked by Ezekiel. Severely rebuked for breaking an oath in the name of God to a heathen king. King. So even even if the reason I'm mentioning that because is because some people say that uh, Charles II, when he when he took the Solemn League and Covenant, was under duress. Uh, even if you are, if you really don't want to sign it, don't sign it. <laughs> don't sign it. Even if your head's going to be chopped off, don't sign it. Because once you sign an oath before God. God expects you to perform it. It's no excuse to turn around. See, Joshua could have turned around and said, I didn't realize they were giving nights. God says you took an oath in my name, my protection is on them. So if the thing you're binding yourself to is lawful and right in the sight of God, you are pledged to it. If you actually bind yourself to a sin, you must seek repentance from it. There's no doubt about that. But if you, what you've pledged yourself to is right, then it doesn't matter how much it hurts you, you fulfill it. So the point is that these documents are meant to last to perpetuity from one generation to another. What about the argument that the king repealed it? He burned the covenants, he abolished the acts that had approved them and so on. Right, fine, fair enough. But it is not possible to pull out of a covenant if God is a party to it. Let's understand that. If God is a party to a covenant, you cannot pull out of it. I mentioned a minute ago that no child can get out of a baptismal covenant. Never. It's on you. And you're obligated to fulfill it for the rest of your days. You remember that. If you're here baptized in a proper way, remember these vows are upon you to fulfill to seek the Lord and to follow Him. We cannot get out of it. I read recently this particular statement. I didn't take a note of who made it, but God does not recognize any attempt to withdraw from a legitimate obligation that is made to Himself. Let me repeat that. God does not recognize any attempt to withdraw from a legitimate obligation that is made to Him. I want you to listen to two covenanters as they're on the scaffold just about to be hanged because of their adherence to a covenanted reformation. The Marcus of Argyle, listen to him. We are tied by covenants to religion and to the reformation of this land. Those that were then unborn are yet engaged to it. And it, is, it passes the power of all the magistrates under heaven to absolve them from the oath of God. Reverend James Guthrie, as he went up to be hanged, I bear witness to the National Covenant of Scotland 
and to the solemn league and covenant between the three kingdoms. These sacred, solemn, public oaths of God, I believe, can be loosed by no person, no party, no power upon the earth, but are still binding upon these kingdoms, and will be forever hereafter. And they are ratified and sealed by the conversion of thousands of souls since entering into them. And then, just before he sang, he pulled the hood of his face and he shouted, the covenants will yet be Scotland's reviving. And then they hanged him. They obviously considered that these covenants bound to perpetuity. One more quotation. The allegation that the covenants were rejected by the nation, by the king, by the acts recissory, and that they have ceased to be obligatory on the principle that the authority which acts a law may afterwards repeal it is of no weight with those who have regard to scriptural precedents. In the covenants of our illustrious forefathers, the exalted mediator was one of the contracting parties, and he can never give to a people a right to dispense with the obligation of solemn duties enjoined in his word. And before I leave the question of who is bound to this covenant, um, I've only got one more point to go, really, but let me make this before I leave this. I want you to consider that the daughter nations of the British nation may well be bound to the Solemn League and Covenant too. I mean by that Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, and even, arguably, the United States. What I, meant, what I want you to remember about these countries is that they were established by settlers. Now, a settler is not an immigrant. An immigrant is someone who comes into a duly constituted nation, like people come into our own country as immigrants, because this is a nation. A settler is someone who goes to an area that is not constituted as a nation state. Now, when the sons and daughters of Britain went to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and even to the States, to constitute them either as colonies of the British crown or as separate nations, they took great care to identify themselves with the British crown. Great care. I'll just quote from the Canadian Constitution. A really short quote, don't worry, and I know it may seem a bit dry, but just think about it. Think about what these people are saying. Whereas the provinces of Canada have expressed their desire to be united in one dominion, it's still called the Dominion of Canada, under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and whereas such a union would conduce to the welfare of the provinces and promote the interests of the British Empire, and so on, it says that the commander-in-chief of our land and naval forces is hereby declared to be the Queen. What's that nation doing in its constitution? Allying itself to the crown. What is the crown? a party to the Solemn League and Covenant. That's my point. Think about it. Even the colonies of the states think about that too. Last of all, what are the implications of these covenants being binding? First, whatever we think, God still looks at us as covenanted. Think about that. Even if we've completely forgotten it, God still thinks of our nation as a covenanted nation. I came across a beautiful quotation by an American author in, at the end of the 18th century. Although a covenanted people may so far forget and disown their special relation to God, as neither to be aware of their obligation or even to expect a blessing, Yet the Lord will not on that account give up his interest in them, and neither will he give up his special relation to them through covenant. What the Lord did for his people Israel, he will do in his own time and way for every Christian covenanted land. That's quite remarkable. And I want to encourage you to think of this nation as being still in covenant with God, 
with the special rewards and punishments which come in connection with such a relationship. Second, if it's still in force, our actual ignorance of it is really woeful and inexcusable. Uh, But it helps you to understand something. See, in the Bible, when Josiah became the king, they discovered the book of the law. They discovered the book of the covenant. And it was actually read. And when it was read, the rulers of the nation, in church and in state, and they were actually more distinct than you realize in the Old Testament. Some people think it's one wasn't one. There was a council in the state and a council in the church. The rulers in both tore their clothes. They had forgotten what the book of the covenant actually was. And Josiah immediately summoned them. And the people covenanted themselves before God. They had forgotten it. We've forgotten it. We've forgotten that we've undertaken to abolish what is distasteful to God and to legislate what is pleasing. We've forgotten it. Do we call Alex Salmon to account for it? Do we call the Queen with respect to account for it? She is still the head of the Parliament. Do we call the Prime Minister to account for it? Do we call our ministers, our elders and our people to account? Have we forgotten our solemn league and covenant? Have we forgotten our national covenant that was sealed with blood? How could it be that we've forgotten such a thing? But it's inexcusable. Third, we are seriously transgressing the terms of that covenant. I don't need to tell you that. Since the Second World War, the declension in the three kingdoms is hastening. Really, really hastening. The foundations are shaken. When you look around you and you wonder what next, everything is crumbling. You wonder why the judgment of God, well, some of it is the judgment of God, I grant that. Some of it actually is the judgment of God. But you wonder why a more overt judgment hasn't fallen upon us. Because since the Second World War, for a variety of reasons, the acceleration downhill has really gone apace. So much so that a person who was thinking and rational and considerate in the 1960s could hardly understand the kind of world we're living in today. In a short space of time, and 40 to 50 years is a very short space of time. But still, because of the covenant, There is an element of this that we are still blessed for our Father's sake. I have no doubt that God honoured that covenant in these three nations for a long, long time. And even now, you can almost hear God saying, how can I give you up, Scotland? How can I give you up, Scotland? Even the other churches of of the continent call you the purest daughter of the Reformation. Maybe the French church would quibble at that. She was beautiful too because before she was mercilessly butchered into near non-existence. But even that was turned into God to good account because it became the foundation largely of American religion and so on. The purest daughter of the Reformation. You can almost hear God saying to a parliament that is about to legislate for same-sex marriage, how can I give you up? I remember the love of your espousals. I remember the thousands and the hundreds of thousands who signed a bond in blood for me. God is reluctant to let us go. Let me read something else to you in that connection. It's a circumstance worthy of observation that people in those countries where the faith was ratified and secured by scriptural vows are the countries in which True religion has been better preserved and political liberty transmitted from one age to another, much better than in places where covenanting was not known. Revivals of scriptural principle, too, have occurred more in these countries than in the latter. And that is a truth as well. And listen to an American writer. I'm nearly done. I'm sorry that this has gone on probably longer, but anyway... Please bear with me. Listen to an American writer who's writing just before the British Empire ceased to be. And he's writing about America first. He says, no nation, not even Israel, he says, for 74 years after the conquest of Palestine has seen prosperity like ours. 
at the Declaration of Independence, there were but a few descendants of the British Covenanters west of the Allegheny Mountains, who formed the basis of the British colonies. Remember, remember that. Now they number not less than 12 million souls. And in less than two generations, they have subdued the forest, cultivated the farms, and built cities from the city of Pittsburgh to the shores of the Pacific. Our trade covers every sea, and there is no nation on earth that in proportion to the number of people are so many schools, academies and colleges. Yes, he says, it's to be deplored that these are becoming corrupted. But this is only our sin which is abusing the Lord's great goodness to us as a covenanted people. All this is the doing of Christ the Lord and it is wondrous in our eyes. And why, he says, looking across the Atlantic, is the little island of Britain the home of the mightiest nations on the globe? Why is there more orthodoxy and Christian practice in Britain than in all the other Protestant churches of the old world? The only answer is that she, like Israel, has nationally covenanted with God. We in America must give God the glory and trace our mercies to the same covenant source. That's what I mean by saying that we are still, to some extent, blessed for our Father's sake. I'm quite sure that's why God, God's hand trembles above us. As though he almost doesn't want to smite. It's lingering as long as it possibly can. But when it comes down, it'll come down. His chastising wrath on Israel was very severe. But how long he bore with that covenanted people. How long he bore with it. How can I give you up, Israel? So let me close with our need to rebuild. You may think it's impossible to rebuild. We all feel like that. A minister in the 20th century said, a national movement in repentance and faith to repeal the Acts for Cicero on our statute book and to renew the covenants would be as life from the dead throughout this empire of ours. That was written in the 20th century while the empire could still be thought of as existing. Notice, a national movement in repentance and faith for the repeal of the acts which put a blot on the covenants and the renewing of the covenants would be as life from the dead. But friends, we must begin with the church. And surely it's only right to close with this. There at its zenith, Scotland, England and Ireland covenanted to seek one church, one confession, one form of government, and one catechism. And for a moment, it was there. Before the bloody dragon was let loose again, before compromise set in, for a moment, it was there. And should it not be the first thing that we should seek to do? To recognize that our witness to the nation will only be on a proper footing when we show ourselves able to gather around these ancient standards again. What about it is so impossible that we cannot regather and constitute ourselves, readopt the same form of government, the same standards, simply around the Westminster standards and as one cohort and as one army and as one people stand covenanted before the nation and say, no, you pledge yourselves before God. Because as long as the nation can look at us in our fragments and in our ruined condition, it will probably never take serious what we say. That doesn't change the fact that when we call the parliaments to remember that they are under oath to God, whether they like it or not, that doesn't change the fact that that's real, yes. But our voice is just simply less effective because we're not able to speak as one. May the Lord help us to understand our past and to do something in our present to help our children. Because what on earth is going to be that portion if we allow the church to decay any further and the land with it? In a covenanted nation, the nation rises with the church and falls with it. In a non-covenanted nation, I have no comment. In a covenanted nation, the nation rises and falls as the church rises and falls. Why is the nation in a mess? Because the church is in a mess. And let the church of God put herself on the old footing of 
covenants and standards. And we would see a change. May the Lord bless these thoughts on a great theme which I haven't really done justice to.